we'll be going over IRS Form 5471, Information Return of U.S. Persons with Respect to Certain Foreign Corporations. So this is a form that a lot of taxpayers won't see. However, uh, this was actually a, a request from someone watching a, a, a video posted on IRS Form 8990, uh, which in some cases has to do with information uh, that you would find on Form 5471. So if this form is for uh, taxpayers uh, that meet certain category of requirements where they have to provide the IRS information uh, related to their uh, relationship with certain foreign corporations. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, statutory requirements for this. So Internal Revenue Code uh, 6038, uh, which you'll see in the instructions for this form, uh, that has to do with the information reporting requirements when it comes to certain foreign corporations and partnerships. And then 6046 uh, specifically gives guidance as to the returns uh, of, of an organization or reorganization for foreign corporations and stock acquisitions. So uh, certainly you can peel into the, into the Internal Revenue Code for more uh, detailed guidance. However, uh, the more important thing probably has to do with uh, category of filers. So if you see uh, sec uh, item B uh, uh, up at the top right hand corner, you'll see category of filer. Uh, a lot of this information will be pretty straightforward uh, once you understand the category that you're in and what information you need to report. So, uh, and, and this is a six page form uh, with lots of schedules. So it's important to pay particular attention to uh, the category of filer that suits your uh, specific situation. So let's go to the top and we'll cover uh, briefly before we get into the step-by-step -step, uh, each of these categories. So starting with category one. In general, a category one filer is someone who is a U.S. shareholder of a foreign corporation that was a section 965 specified foreign corporation known as an SFC at any time during the foreign corporation's tax year, uh, either ending with or within the, the shareholder's tax year and who owns that stock on the last day of the year in which the foreign corporation was a section 965 SFC. Uh, so um, pretty much U.S. Uh, shareholder for the purpose of this, a U.S. person is either a citizen or a resident, a domestic partnership, a domestic corporation, or an estate or trust that is not a foreign estate or trust. So within the broader category of, of category one, that is your typical category filer. Within that, you see 1A, 1B, and 1C. And the instructions are pretty clear that a category 1A filer is a category one filer that is neither a 1B nor a 1C filer. So if you're neither 1B or 1C, you're 1A. Uh, what constitutes a 1B filer is a person who is an unregulated Section 958A U.S. shareholder of a foreign-controlled 965 SFC. So the definition of an unrelated Section 958A U.S. shareholder is someone who owns within the meaning of Section 958A stock of a foreign controlled Section 965 SFC and is not related to the foreign controlled uh, Section 965 SFC. So that is a Category 1B filer. A Category 1C filer is a person who is a related constructive U.S. shareholder of a foreign controlled Section 965 SFC. So um, a constructive shareholder uh, basically means someone who 
is a U.S. shareholder with respect to the foreign controlled Section 965 SFC who does not own stock of the foreign controlled Section 965 SFC and is related to the foreign controlled Section 965 SFC. So if you're not either a 1B or a 1C category filer, but you are a category 1 filer, then you would be category 1A. For category 2, uh, this is the category that includes a U.S. citizen or a resident who is an officer or director of a foreign corporation in which a U.S. person has acquired either stock that meets the 10% ownership requirement with respect to the foreign corporation and an additional 10% or more either in value or in voting power of the outstanding stock of the foreign corporation. So, uh, a category three filer includes the following categories. A U.S. person who acquires stock in a foreign corporation which, when added to any stock owned on the date of acquisition, meets the 10% stock requirement. A U.S. person who acquires stock which, without regard to stock already owned, meets the 10% requirement. A person who is treated as a U.S. shareholder under Section 953C with respects to the foreign corporation. A person who becomes a U.S. person while meeting the 10% stock ownership requirement or a U.S. person who disposes of sufficient stock in the corporation to reduce his or her interest to less than 10% stock ownership. So category four filer includes a U.S. person who had control of a foreign corporation during the accounting period of the foreign corporation. And then finally, category five filers. A category five filer is a person who was a U.S. shareholder that owned stock in a foreign corporation that was a CFC at any time during the tax year, the foreign cor corporation's tax year, ending with or within the U.S. shareholder's tax year, and who owned that stock on the last day in that year in which the foreign corporation was a CFC. So again, similar to category one filers, there are three categories of uh, a category five filer. So a category five A filer is anyone that does not meet the category five B or five C requirement, but is still a category five filer. A category five B filer is someone who is an unrelated Section 958A U.S. shareholder of a foreign-controlled CFC. And then a Category 5C filer is a related constructive U.S. shareholder of a foreign-controlled CFC. So uh, basically, for purposes of Category 5C, the related U.S. Share, constructive U.S. shareholder is someone who does not own within the section of not section within the meaning of the section 958A criteria stock of the foreign controlled CFC and is related to the foreign controlled CFC. So, so those are the categories of filers. There is kind of a a matrix chart within the form instructions that state what schedules you would be required to file in the case of, you know, depending on which category. Uh, so, um, for example, Schedule A on this form is only completed by Category 3 and 4 filers, while uh, Schedule G is completed by uh, category 1C, 2, 3, 5A, and 5C filers. Sorry, Schedule G is completed by Schedule 1C, 3, 4, 
5A and 5C filers. So once you determine what category of filer you are, you'll need to refer to the matrix chart that is in the form instructions to be able to understand which schedules you're completing on this tax form. Now we'll go through the, the entirety of this tax form, but there is no category of filer that uh, is required to complete every single item. Uh, category four filers happen to uh, have the most reporting requirements, but they do not need to complete schedule O, for example. And unfortunately, there are separate schedules that are not in this tax form. Uh, you can refer to the form instructions on how to uh, pull up, for example, a separate schedule G1 or separate schedule H, se separate schedule P, things of that nature. I'll simply go through the schedules that are attached to this form and then uh, we may produce videos about the separate schedules at a later date, depending on audience input. So uh, let's start with the top of the form and then we'll break down schedule by schedule. So at the top of the form, you'll enter the name of the, per the, the filer. Uh, actually, at the very top, you'll need to provide the information that was furnished for the foreign company's uh, corporation's accounting period. So uh, beginning on what, a, you know, if they have a fiscal year that is not the same as a calendar year tax year, you'll enter that information. If it's a calendar year tax year, then it'll be pretty straightforward. So name of the person uh, filing the return and their identifying number. Uh, this can be a social security number. It can be an uh, employer identification number. Um, depends on what type of taxpayer is filing this return. And then uh, uh, right below that, you'll enter the, the number and the street address, mailing address. In uh, section B, you'll select the type of category that meets your criteria. Select, you should select one. Uh, there may be instances where you meet more than one criteria, but Probably not. Uh, then underneath of that, you'll enter the percentage of the foreign corporation's voting stock that you owned at the end of the accounting period. So make sure that the percentage that you enter uh, corresponds with the category. For example, if you uh, selected a category that represented you were less than a 10% stake shareholder, don't enter 20% of the voting stock here. Just do a quick check to make sure that the percentage of stock ownership is commensurate with the category. Um, then you'll enter your, your tax year uh, right below uh, line C. Uh, you'll check item D if for some reason this is the final year of the foreign corporation's existence. Uh, for tax purposes, like if they reorganize, if there's a liquidation, if there's an election to treat it as a disregarded entity. If this item is checked, then you, you will need to complete uh, Schedule uh, O, which uh, is not attached to this form. It's actually a separate uh, document. And uh, the way I found separate schedules uh, that are not attached to this uh, document. I simply googled IRS form 5471 and the name of the appropriate schedule. It's in the IRS website, but it's not the most obvious place. So I simply googled whichever uh, offline schedule I needed access to. In, section, in item E, you're going to check this if there were any accepted specified foreign financial assets that, that you're reporting. Uh, you don't have to report these separately on Form 8938 if, if you're reporting them here. Uh, the instructions contain more guidance, but if you, if you check this box, uh, there are there is additional guidance on how this would uh, impact, uh, again, uh, Form 8938, which is the Statement of Specified Foreign Financial Assets. Uh, for item F, if you've 
if you're using alternative information as de defined under Revenue Procedure uh, 2019-40, uh, then you would check this box. And specifically, this is a, a safe harbor uh, provision uh, for determining certain uh, taxable income items. So if you've if you're checking this box, be sure that you're um, double checking that you, that you meet the safe harbor provisions as outlined. And then if you check box F, then you'll need to enter a corresponding code for alternative information into line G. So uh, the instructions have eight different types of codes that you can enter uh, based on how uh, you were receiving this alternative information uh, that was, uh, you know, whether it was prepared uh, via U.S. GAAP, uh, whether it was prepared using international financial reporting standards, so on and so forth. So uh, make sure that you uh, use the appropriate corresponding code. And then finally, on line H, you're going to enter um, as many people as are applicable. So you can file a form 5471 and the appropriate schedules and if you're if you have the same reporting requirements as uh, other persons you can list those persons here name address identifying number and then whether or not they're a shareholder officer or director so if you're filing this on behalf of other people you can list them in, in line H So towards the bottom, uh, you'll complete the information regarding the foreign corporation. So, um, you know, line 1A is the name and address. Uh, B1 is the employer identification number. B2 is a reference number, uh, which is required if there is no employer ID number in line 1, 1B1. Uh, you can enter a number in both sections. But if B1 is filled in, you don't have to put in a reference number. Um, and then item C is the country under whose laws the corporation is incorporated. Uh, lines D through H are all uh, information about the corporation. So date of incorporation, the principal place of business, business activity code number, which you should be able to look up in the form instructions at the very end, depending on the type of industry uh, your business is in. Uh, there's a corresponding business activity code. And then uh, 1G would be the, the name of that principal business activity. Uh, for example, educational services such as schools, colleges, and universities, would have a corresponding principal business activity code of 611000. That would be 611000, and then educational services. And then the functional currency code, there is a corresponding code in the form instructions that you would be able to use as well. So in section two, you're going to provide information about the corporation's accounting period. So if there's a branch office in the United States, you'll enter that information in 2A. If there is a U.S. tax return, you can enter the taxable income or the loss, followed by the, the income tax paid after all credits. This is all information that you should have access to. Uh, and then in 2C, uh, the foreign corporation's uh, agent in the country that it's incorporated in, followed by the name and address. So you're getting uh, the taxpayer uh, information with regards to that foreign corporation. And now we start looking at schedules. So uh, there's Schedule A, Schedule B, Schedule C, Schedule F, 
Schedule G, Schedule I, and that is it for this form. However, uh, there is also in separate files Schedule E, Schedule E1, Schedule G1, Schedule H, Schedule J, Schedule M, Schedule O, Schedule P, Schedule Q, and Schedule R. So we're only going to go over these schedules here. So in Schedule A, which is required of Category 3 and 4 filers, you'll simply uh, describe the class of each, uh, provide a written description of each class of stock, the number of shares issued and outstanding uh, at the beginning and then at the end of the actual accounting period. So, you know, if I owned a major piece of Toyota Corporation, B shares. I don't know if Toyota has A and B shares, but let's just imagine they had B shares and they have 10 million shares at the beginning of the accounting period, uh, but then they did a buyback and now they have 9.5 million. You would enter it pretty much just like that. So whatever stock of the foreign corporation, you're going to enter that information in Schedule A. Go to Schedule B, uh, then there are two parts. And according to the form instructions, Category 3 and 4 filers need to file Part 1, while uh, in Part 2, Category 1A, 1C, 3, 4, 5A, and 5C filers all have to complete Part 2. So in part one, line by line, by each uh, shareholder, you're going to enter the name, address, and identifying number of the shareholder, the description of each class of stock. So of this you know, Toyota stock, let's just say um, Toyota Corporation B shares uh, and of this 10 million, you owned 1 million. And then after the stock buyback, you still owned a million. And then the pro rata share of subpart F income, you will enter this as a percentage of the total income uh, based on So at the end of the period, whatever your prorated uh, you know, percentage of the income. So in here, at the beginning of your period, your ownership was 10%. Uh, since you didn't sell any shares, uh, it's going to be slightly higher. It's going to be whatever a million divided by 9.5 million is. Uh, but let's, for, let's say for simplicity's sake, uh, we did sell some stock, so we still own 10%. We would simply put 10% here. Um, whatever that percentage changed to during the year, you would uh, change it accordingly. And then, so this is for U.S. shareholders. In part two, it's for direct shareholders. And this is one where category 1A, 1C, 3, 4, 5A, and 5C filers almost complete it. And you would report the direct shareholders of the foreign corporation. Um, if it's owned by a foreign disregarded entity, then you'll include the name of the FDE and then that owner of the FDE. And again, the same thing uh, basically applies the example up above. So if I were this shareholder, I would put my name followed by my address. And then my identifying number. In Schedule C, uh, this is basically an income statement. You're going to report everything in the functional currency based of, of the foreign corporation, and then you're going to convert that 
to US dollars. And there are instructions for how to do that transfer. If the functional currency of the foreign cor corporation happens to be the US dollar, then you're only going to complete this column on the right. Uh, but basically everything here should come uh, from in an audited statement in, in an ideal world. But it should be at least in accordance with uh, GAAP principle, uh, US generally accepted accounting principles. So all of these are pretty straightforward. I'll highlight the sections that uh, that the form instructions give particular guidance to. So when it comes to line eight, you're going to enter any foreign uh, currency transaction gain or loss as reported on the income statement. Uh, if there are amounts that are included in other comprehensive income, then uh, you're going to uh, go to uh, line 23 and line 24 instead. So um, that may be marked on your income statement. That's what the notes in the, in the instructions say. In line 16, you're going to enter any transactional taxes uh, that don't include items reportable in the income tax expense. So you're going to report income taxes on a different line. So any other taxes, you'll enter them in line 16. Income taxes, uh, whether it's current income tax liability or deferred, uh, you're going to put them here. So then uh, lines 20 and 21 have their own unique instructions. So uh, there's a specific definition for unusual and infrequently occurring items. Uh, this is actually defined by GAAP, uh, Topic two, uh, uh, FASB Accounting Standards Codification. So ASC Topic 220, Income Statement, Subtopic 220-20. And it specifically provides guidance about what constitutes an unusual or infrequently occurring item. So um, you're only going to enter uh, items impacting income that meet this uh, specific uh, definition. Um, and then in line 21, you'll enter the income tax expense or benefit uh, as re reported in accordance with GAAP uh, this would be ASC 740 under income taxes. Uh, this may uh, get a little bit tricky, so you'll want to make sure that you're uh, reporting this information as it was reported to you via, uh, using GAAP principles. And then lines 23, A, B, and C, all of these, um, so all of these amounts are defined in ASC 220, which is income statement reporting comprehensive income. So for line 23A, you're going to enter foreign currency translation adjustments before the income tax is allocated to it. In 23B, you're going to enter other comprehensive income. This could be foreign currency gains or losses on hedging transactions, pensions and other post-retirement benefit uh, retirement benefits, and then certain investments available for sale. So and then in 23C, you're going to enter the income tax expense allocated to uh, other comprehensive income items uh, in, the, in the allocation. In Schedule F, you're going to report everything in U.S. dollars. And again, this is the balance sheet. Should be reported in, in accordance with GAAP. So uh, everything at the beginning of the accounting period, everything at the end of the accounting period. Uh, most of these items are pretty straightforward. Uh, line set, uh, 3, uh, which is derivatives, and line 17, which is derivatives in the liabilities and shareholders' equity uh, column. Uh, the instructions basically state to enter the total asset amount of derivatives on line three and the total amount of liability on line seven in accordance with ASC 815, which addresses derivatives and hedgings. Uh, but you do not net positions. Uh, so if you have a positive position here, you would leave it here. You don't net it here to net 
you know, positive or net negative derivatives. In column G, this is other information and this is primary, primarily a series of yes, no questions. So we'll go through the items in particular that the form instructions uh, cover. So question one, uh, did the foreign corporation own at least a 10% interest in any foreign partnership during the tax year? Uh, and so uh, if so, if yes, then the required statement uh, as indicated in the form instructions must include um, the name and an and EIN of the foreign partnership, identify which tax forms, if any, uh, the foreign partnership filed for its tax year. So this could be form uh, 1042, 1065, or 10 or 8804. The name of the partnership representative, uh, and then the beginning and ending dates of the tax year for that partnership. Uh, if there are any items that I don't mention, uh, it's because the form instructions don't contain any guidance, and these are uh, pretty uh, direct yes/no questions. So in question three, uh, check the yes box if the foreign corporation is the tax owner of an FDE or an FB. So the tax owner of an FDE is the person that's treated as owning the assets and liabilities for purposes of U.S. tax law. Uh, if the foreign cor corporation is the owner of an FDE or an FB and you are a Category 4, 5A, or 5C filer, uh, then you're required to attach IRS Form 8858 to this submission. If the foreign corporation's uh, the tax owner and you are not a Category 1B, 4, or 5 filer, then you must attach the statement described in the form instructions in lieu of Form 8858. And the statement in lieu of Form 8858 simply must list the name of the FDE or FB, the country under whose laws this entity was organized, and then the employer identification number if applicable. So that's the basic requirement if you are not a category 1B, 4, or 5 filer. Uh, so for questions 4B and 4C, uh, you'll complete them if the following two criteria apply. The foreign corporation is a related party to the U.S. filer within the meaning of Internal Revenue Code Section 59A uh, subsection G, and if the U.S. filer made or accrued a base erosion payment to or has a base erosion tax benefit with respect to the foreign corporation. And the IRS defines base erosion payment as any amount paid or accrued by the U.S. filer to a foreign corporation that is a related party to the U.S. filer within the section meaning of Section 59AG, and with respect to which a U.S. deduction is allowed under Chapter 1. Base erosion uh, payments also include amounts received or accrued by the foreign corporation in connection with the acquisition of the depreciable uh, or amorti amorti amortizable property, reinsurance payments, and certain payments related to expatriated entities. So if, if applicable, then you'll enter the uh, total amount of the payments and then the tax benefits, which basically means any U.S. deduction that's allowed with uh, under uh, Chapter 1 uh, with respect to those payments. For questions 5A and 5B, if the corporation paid any interest or royalty, uh, for which a d deduction is disallowed, then check yes and enter the total amount for which the deduction is not allowed in line 5B. For question 6, uh, check yes if, um, if applicable, if you're filing uh, and claiming a deduction under Section 250 with respect to foreign-derived intangible income. And then you'll enter uh, amounts 
related to that in 6b, 6c, and 6d. You'll enter uh, these amounts in U.S. dollars, so gross receipts derived from all sales of general property to the foreign corporation, the amount of gross receipts derived from all sales of in intangible property, and then in 6d, the amount of gross receipts derived from all services provided to the corporation. So general property, intangible property, and then services provided. In question uh, 9A and 9B, you'll check 9A if the foreign corporation received any intangible property in a prior year or in the current tax year for which uh, you're required to report 360, uh, Section 367D annual income exclusion. So this must happen uh, if the inclusion is attributed to the intangible property transferred to a foreign corporation over the useful life of the property. So you'll check yes, and then you'll enter in the, country, in the corporation's functional currency the amount of earnings and profits reduction under Section 367D2B for the tax year. For question 10, uh, if the co corporation was an expatriated foreign subsidiary, uh, then you'll select yes and you'll have to attach a statement. Uh, according to the form instructions, the corporation may qualify as an expatriated foreign subsidiary under Treasury regulations if the corporation is a CFC with respect, to an, with respect to which an expatriated entity defined in Treasury Regulations 1.7874-12A8 is a U.S. shareholder. So if, if this is the case, then certain transactions involving an expatriated foreign subsidiary and its U.S. shareholders might be subject to special rules. You'll need to attach a statement that provides the name and the EIN of the domestic corporation or partnership and the relationship of the foreign corporation to that domestic corporation or partnership. And then in question 14, uh, you'll need to refer to the checklist of 22 questions for Schedule G line 14. Uh, there is a table specifically in the form instructions I will not go over in this video, but it is 22 questions, and if any of them are applicable, then you need to select yes in line 14 and type in the uh, appropriate code. So, and then you'll need to attach a statement, and the code description, for example, let's say, um, code one would be D so this is uh, section one a de minimis code description uh, so DM is de minimis and then your statement would need to include the amount that was excluded by reason of the de minimis rule right so all of this information is in the form instructions uh, we'll use a different uh, code that you might use for hedge active and hedging commodities, AHC, and then you would need to provide a statement that includes from the form instruction the sum of the excluded amounts as described in Internal Revenue Code Section 954C. So just if you need to, well, if you need to complete Schedule G, you'll need to eventually get down to item 14 and follow that matrix and, and answer those questions and enter the corresponding codes. For item 15, uh, if the foreign corporation does have an interest expense that's disallowed under section 167J, then the instructions state um, that you will need to enter the amount from the current year's Form 8990, Line 31. So if you have, if you 
if you have a, di a disallowed interest interest expense, then you'll need to carry this amount from Form 8990, line 31. Line 16 is a previously disallowed interest expense, again, under Section 163J, carried forward. So if this is applicable, then you would go to the prior year's Form 8990, uh, line 31, and you would pull that a number as appropriate. For questions 17A and 17B, uh, you'll check yes if there is an extraordinary reduction with respect to any controlling Section 245A shareholder of the foreign cor corporation. Uh, this is defined in Treasury Regulations Section 1.245A-5I2. Uh, so, um, that is the that that reference contains the definition of extraordinary uh, reduction. If you go to, if, if you answer yes, then you'll need to determine whether or not there was an election made to close the tax year, so that no amount was treated as either an extraordinary reduction amount or a tiered extraordinary reduction amount. Uh, you'll check yes. Uh, if any controlling Section 245A shareholder made an election close to the tax year that no amount is treated as an extraordinary uh, reduction amount or tiered extraordinary amount. Um, see, questions 18 and 19 are both referenced in the form instructions. So question 18, you'll check the yes box if uh, during the tax year the reporting corporation had loans uh, to or from the related party for which safe haven rules apply uh, and for which the reporting uh, corporation used a rate of interest within the safe haven range of the Treasury regulations, 100% to 130% of the AFR for the relevant term. Of question 19A and question 19B, you'll check yes, uh, only if the filer is a domestic corporation. Uh, and then if you do check yes, then you'll need to provide the total amount of the transactions that were described uh, in Treasury Regulation Section 1.385-3 uh, during the tax period uh, the, the current tax year and the preceding three tax years or during the period that began 36 months before the distribution or acquisition and ending 36 months after. So um, you'll need to provide the total amount of the debt instrument issuances addressed in line 19A. So uh, the amount for, for any related distributions and acquisitions, and then in section two, the amount of any uh, related party indebtedness. Finally, in schedule I, uh, then if, if, you if you completed item H on page one, then you must create a separate schedule I for each category four, 5A, or 5B filer. So uh, let's re quickly revisit what item H is at the top of the form. This is uh, when you completed information uh, for multiple people. So you'll need to create a separate schedule I for each of those individuals. And So when it comes to Schedule I, you're going to use Schedule I to report this in U.S. dollars, uh, the shareholder's pro rata share of income from the foreign corporation uh, that's reportable, um, either under a subpar F and, and then other income realized from a, a distribution. Uh, you may be able to use alternative information uh, to determine certain amounts under this schedule, but there are uh, very specific instructions in the form. So in line one, you'll enter uh, subpart F income 
Uh, if you have subpart F income, you must report it on your tax return. Uh, so line 1A uh, contains the foreign source portion of any subpart F income inclusions that were attributable to the sale or exchange of, by a CFC of stock of another foreign corporation that is eligible for Section 245A dividends uh, received deduction uh, pursuant to Section 964E4. So you'll include that amount, if any, uh, that's not eligible for the Section 245A dividends received deduction. And then if you're not a corporate U.S. shareholder, you can leave this blank. Uh, if, if, if it's for line 1B, you're going to enter the amount of the U.S. shareholders part sub F income inclusion attributable to tiered hybrid dividends received by the CFC. So um, generally, this is a dividend that's received by a CFC from another CFC. Uh, to the extent that the receiving CFC's hybrid deduction accounts with respect, with respect to shares of stock of the CFC that pays the dividend. And then in line 1C, uh, this is the subpart, income, uh, subpart F income inclusion attributable to tiered extraordinary disposition amounts uh, resulting from distributions from an extraordinary disposition account of the shareholder filing this form. And the line 1D is the subpart F income inclusion attributable to tiered extra extraordinary reduction amounts resulting from extraordinary reductions. Lines 1E through 1H, you're going to enter the amounts from worksheet A. Lines 63, 65, 67, and 69, respectively. So um, you can find Worksheet A in the form instructions. You'll have to complete Worksheet A and then enter the results in these four lines. Uh, for line two, you'll enter uh, any earnings invested in U.S. Pro property. There's a workshop uh, Worksheet B in the form uh, instructions that you'll have to complete. Uh, in line four, uh, factoring income. Uh, this is defined in uh, section 864 D1. Uh, you'll enter this income if no subpart F income is reported on one line, line 1A of worksheet A uh, because of the operation of the de minimis rule. So um, when you report these lines on your income tax return, the form instructions state that U.S. shareholders should compute their pro rata share of income on Schedule I, lines 1A through 1H, line 2, and line 4. For a corporate shareholder, you'll enter the result from one, line 1A onto your Form 1120 Schedule C, line 16A. Uh, You'll enter the result from line B on Schedule C, line 16B, and then you'll enter the remaining lines, 1C through 1H, 2 and 4, on Schedule C, line 16C. Uh, for a non-corporate U.S. shareholder, you'll enter this on Schedule 1 of your Form 1040, line 8N, which is the other income uh, inclusion. So in line 5, 5A, uh, 5A through 5E, there are separate instructions in the form uh, guidance. So in 5A, you'll enter the amount of dividends uh, received from the foreign corporation that's eligible for a deduction. Uh, this does not include the amount of dividends not eligible for a deduction. Um, so... In 5B, you'll enter the amount of dividends received uh, from the foreign corporation that's an extraordinary disposition amount as defined by Treasury regulations. Uh, in 5C, uh, you'll enter the amount of the dividends uh, that's an extraordinary uh, reduction amount. And then in line 5D, you'll enter the amount of hybrid dividends uh, that, that you receive from the foreign corporation. 
in general, the case of a for domestic corporation, uh, a dividend received by the domestic corporation from the CFC is a hybrid dividend to the extent of the sum of the U.S. shareholders' hybrid deduction accounts with respect to shares of stock. In line 5E, you will report any dividends not previously reported on lines 5A through 5D. And then on line C or 6, you'll enter any... Um, if there was previously taxed earnings and profits that were distributed, you'll enter any foreign currency gain or loss recognized on the distribution. In lines 8A through 8C, you will answer in line 8A, yes or no, whether or not you had an extraordinary disposition account. If you answered yes, then you'll enter uh, the account balance at the beginning and at the end of the tax year in U.S. dollars. In line 8C, you'll enter the CFC's total extraordinary dist distribution disposition account balance with respect to all shareholders, both at the beginning and at the end of the tax year. And then for line 9, if the foreign corporation is a CFC and the filer is a domestic corporation, You'll enter the sum of the hybrid deduction accounts with respect to each share of stock of the CFC that the domestic corporation owns directly or indirectly. So that is a basic walkthrough. Of course, there's a lot more complexity in this uh, form that uh, we do not have time for uh, in this video. However, uh, to the extent that you have any questions or concerns about items that appear, uh, please let me know in the comments section or send me an email and I will attempt to research and create a video for that. Uh, if you uh, want to read more in-depth guidance, uh, we've written an article about this. You can go to our article on, on, on our website, teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS form, uh, 50, uh, 5471, you should see our article. If you like our articles, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you like our YouTube channel or videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, if, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please hit me up in the comments section or send me an email. Thank you very much and have a great day.